Yeah, so to illustrate what I mean by embodied metaphor, I have a quote from an article from a study by um, Ray Gibbs and, and Heather Franks, who were looking at um, the experiences of women who have suffered from cancer. And they asked the women in their study, which was published in the journal Health Communication, to write about their experiences of cancer and what it felt like to have cancer in such a way that people who have not experienced it will have some idea of what it feels like. So going beyond the very sort of mundane, you know, it felt very bad, et cetera. So describing the qualitative aspects of their experience. And one of the women in their study wrote this. So she wrote, dance with me, cancer commanded. No, I shrieked in a fusion of fear and disbelief. I wanted nothing to do with this would-be suitor and I surely couldn't comprehend why he had chosen me in the first place. Before I could make sense of the insanity, I realised that this dance was not optional. Cancer's clutch was firm as he led me to the floor. Arm in arm, we were clumsily stepping to the awkward beat of chaos. The dance he had choreographed for me was riddled with mismatched moves. Dangerously low dips were coupled with wild swings and turns. The music was equally discordant. High crescendos crashed into the silence, and then the tempo wildly sped up again. Like a lifeless rag doll, lifelessly pinned to my partner's twisted movement, I was spun in circles of sadness until I was left physically and emotionally exhausted. So you see from this example that from looking at this woman's description of cancer, you get a really, really deep insight into how terrible this thing was. Also how kind of unexpected, and also, in some ways, a kind of like exciting, but perhaps not in a good way. And you'll see that this is a very physical experience. And it's, it's all clearly metaphorical all the way through. She isn't really dancing with anything. And you'll notice that the cancer is embodied. So the cancer becomes uh, the, per the dance partner who's, who's totally in control of her. This is a really good metaphorical way of describing how she completely lacks agency in this experience. So this is what I mean by a kind of potentially embodied metaphor. It certainly involves a lot of references to the body. Um, and she's making the use of bodily experiences to describe her to her, her experience of cancer. And there's been quite a bit of research showing that when we hear or read metaphors like this, these very physical metaphors, in order to make sense of them, we kind of experience to some experience them to some level and in, and to some degree ourselves. So we feel as if we are being danced being danced around the room by the cancer, losing our agency. I don't know if some of you in in the in the room experience this feeling of like being actually in a dance yourselves. And there is some neurological research showing that um, parts of the brain that are responsible for um, organizing movement and um, and um, experiencing movement are actually activated when we can when we encounter even very metaphorical expressions like this but obviously we don't necessarily actually act them out because we would look a bit weird if we did but there is something in our brains which is activated um so the motor neurons are activated when we when we come across this language and that's what i kind of and i'm going to go into a bit more detail in a minute um the structure of today's talk is going to be this so i'm going to be looking at what is embodied metaphor and look at some uh, examples of studies that suggest that metaphors can and are frequently experienced on a bodily level, on a physical level, as we encounter them. And then I'm going to question the idea that metaphors are always embodied all of the time, because I think if every time we encountered a metaphor, we experienced some kind of physical experience, we'd, we'd be exhausted. Um, so are there factors that shape the extent to which and whether or not we actually experience a metaphor in a physical way, um, such as I suggested we might have done following the dancing uh, metaphor, or just sort of hear it in the language and don't necessarily process it with the same depth? Um, and so that make, that takes me on to the second circle in my in my talk, when and by whom are metaphors embodied? I'm going to be looking at some research, some of my own research, but other research by others, also research by others, suggesting that there is a good deal of variation and there are certain factors that shape when people are likely to experience metaphor in an embodied way and when it's more like just to be a metaphor that we encounter.
And then the last two parts of the talk, I'm going to be talking about two of the applications of my research. So these are going to be applying a lot of the things that I talked about in the first two circles, first two blobs of the, of the diagram. One is a, a study that I conducted looking at the ways in which people use metaphor to describe pregnancy loss and what that says about the relationship between metaphor and the body. And then I'm going to be talking about how we use those findings to help support people who've been through pregnancy loss. I should warn you that in this talk, there may be a few very, very sensitive topics. So I, I completely understand if you want to sort of tune out for any of it um, and then tune back in when I come back to maybe lighter stuff, which on that subject is the, the final thing. Look looking at embodied metaphor in advertising. So again, this is applying some of the theoretical findings from the first part of the talk um, to a study that I, a couple of studies that I conducted in collaboration with a, an advertising agency, looking at how to help um, promote, uh, in this case, um, um, access to sexually a sexual health clinic in Birmingham to, to pick up um, sexually transmitted infections, which are unfortunately on the rise um, in the UK. So that's the outline of the talk. And I'll come back to this slide every now and then to show you how much progress we're making around it. So the first thing, what is embodied metaphor? I've got, like, so like I was saying, the idea of embodied metaphor is that when we encounter one of these metaphors that refers to physical experience, we actually, to some extent, experience this physical movement in our minds at the same time as we encounter it. And there've been a number of behavioural studies that suggest that uh, there is some kind of psychological reality to what some people, other people might just think are linguistic expressions. And three of the studies that I'd like to refer to here are three of my favourite studies. And the first study is a, is a study by Schneider et al, who looked at the metaphor that we have in English. And I'm pretty sure it'd be interesting to discuss it afterwards, whether you have this in Chinese as well. Importance is weight. So we have lots of expressions in English like um, it's a very heavy topic or he's a bit of a lightweight, not very serious, to, 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 to show that if something is important, we consider it to be kind of heavy and weighty. And in order to test whether this metaphor goes beyond language and actually has some kind of physical manifestation, Schneider et al. conducted a behavioural study where they gave participants a book. And in this book, it had um, on the front cover, it had an abstract saying roughly what the book was about. Uh, this isn't the actual book. This is a, just a picture of a book that I'm using for illustration. And then they asked the participants to look at the abstract and to assess the extent that, that the importance, the relative importance on a scale from one to ten of the contents of that book. So the participants thought they were just judging it based on the on the contents of the abstract. Unbeknownst to a lot of the, the, the participants is that they had, had been split into two groups. So half the participants received the book as it ordinarily was. And the other half of the participants had the book, but it had a concealed weight. So it actually physically felt much heavier than, than it would otherwise have felt. And they found that in line with the idea of embodied metaphor, um, those participants who, who were holding the really, really, really heavy book literally felt that it was more important, the contents of the, of the, of the book were more important than those who were given the book with, uh, without, the, without the concealed weight, which I think is quite interesting there. Um, so that's the, that's the first of the three studies. The second study is a study by Daniel Casasanto, and he was interested in this idea of resemblances proximity. So we might talk about something is similar to it, we might say it's close to it. And again, it'd be interesting to see if this is in Chinese as well, this metaphor. So we might say this shade of white is close to the shade of white on my on my ceiling, for example. We're not actually close to each other, but we're using closeness to convey similarity. And in order to test the psychological reality of that metaphor, what Casasanto did was they showed participants a number of words on a screen and they asked them to say how similar those words were in meaning. So, for example, you might see pride and meekness. And you might just do this yourselves. You might think, well, pride and duty, they're sort of like fairly similar. There's sort of overlaps in the meaning here, whereas anger and meekness are probably almost opposite. So they're not very similar in meaning. And the manipulation that uh, Casasanto had in his study was he simply put the words further apart on the screen. So some people saw the words together and other people saw them apart and of course they were all mixed in and again they found he found that 
when the words were further apart on the screen, the participants thought that they were more different in meaning than when they were close together on the screen. So again, it's this behavioural support for the idea that um, resemblance is proximity, uh, is an actual physical metaphor as well as a, as a, as a linguistic metaphor. And th these ideas come from the idea that there often are correlates in um, in real world experience. So weighty things may be more important at times or things that are similar to each other are often actually closer together. If you think of like in the supermarket, we put like all the cereals together or the fruit together and so on and so forth. And the third one is my favorite one of these studies. This is testing the kind of the psychological reality again of the idea that morality is cleanliness. So again, we have lots of expressions in English. Like somebody has like a squeaky clean reputation means they're kind of above board. They don't steal money. They're not corrupt. They're very trustworthy. Whereas you might have dirty business or dirty money showing that people lack morality. And in order to test the psychological reality of, um, of this metaphor, Jean and Liegenquest, what they had was they had, um, um, I'm going to come to that picture in a minute. Actually, I shouldn't have shown you that first of all. So what they had was they they had uh, participants go into a room and one group of the participants heard a story about highly moral behaviour, things are, are not corrupt, well behaved, etc. And the other group of participants heard a story about kind of corrupt, dirty dealings, drugs, etc. So on and so forth. And on the way out of the room, allegedly nothing to do with the experiment at all, but as a kind of reward, as a thank you for participating in the study, the participants were offered a gift. It was either a pen or some antiseptic wipes. And they found that the um, the participants who'd been exposed to the um, antiseptic, who'd been exposed to the dirty story, were significantly more likely to uh, ask for the antiseptic wipes. So again, there's kind of like this psychological connection between um, what they were hearing about and what they actually chose. And there were all that var various variations on this study, with participants being asked to think about their own experiences and so on and so forth, all coming up with the same kind of finding. So these are three behavioural studies providing strong support that even very kind of like um, mundane conventional metaphors in English that involve some kind of like physical experience are experienced to some extent on a physical level. So people are experiencing actual weight, actual proximity and actual kind of uncleanliness in response to them. Um, so there are the behavioural studies. There are also a number of neuro neurological studies and neuroimaging studies showing that um, even metaphorical uses of verbs tend to trigger sensory motor responses in the brain. So for example, in English, we can talk about grasp the handle, so hold the handle really, really tightly. We also can talk about grasp the concepts, so you suddenly understand the concept, but it's the same verb to grasp. Similarly, we can kick a ball, uh, when we're playing football, or we can kick a habit. So get rid of a habit, stop smoking, etc. So kick it away, almost literally get rid of it. And there's been studies that have shown that when people um, hear or read these, even these metaphorical uses of these words, there are responses in the brain from the motor cortex showing that on some level, there is some kind of motor action being uh, triggered by the use of these metaphorical uses of words. The same with um, sensory um, words. So in English, we can talk about somebody's had a bad day or we can say she's had a rough day. And that's all, they're almost synonymous. It means that basically her day hasn't been very, very nice. But you see, the second one is metaphorical and it refers to a kind of sensory physical experience, like literally touching something rough. And um, studies have shown that when people are exposed to the, the metaphorical use, which refers to a kind of physical experience, there is activation in the somatosensory cortex, which shows that there's a kind of like sensory response, as if they're literally experiencing some kind of roughness. So this will become relevant right towards the end of the, the, of the talk when I talk about metaphor in advertising. It's one of the reasons why people love metaphor in advertising, because it can trigger these motor responses, uh, sensory responses and also emotional responses as well. Um, there's also there is evidence uh, from gesture studies for the embodied nature of metaphor. If you look at the 
use when they're using metaphors. And I've got some examples from my own studies that I'll be able to show you in a minute. Um, when things like this, so change is motion. I don't know if you can see my hands here, position myself so, so that you can see me properly. Change is motion. It goes with this gesture, but it doesn't go with this gesture. Or organization is physical structure. You might see people doing this when they're talking about organization. Emotional intimacy is proximity. It's not far apart like this. And precision is tightness. So I'm only gonna show him just this once, uh, but that kind of gesture, precision is tightness. So we look at if we look at gestures, they often will accompany the um, the metaphorical words that they correspond to, suggesting again that metaphor works on a physical level as well as, as, as on a linguistic level. Um, there's been some nice work by um, colleagues in, in in my department by Bodo Winter and colleagues uh, testing the. Um, you're, a lot of you be some of you may be familiar with this paradigm of research in cognitive linguistics. Uh, the next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward by two days idea. This is a, a sentence that's often examined in cognitive linguistics because it's particularly interesting. Um, in English, and I know in Chinese you have different ways of conceptualizing time, but in English we have two main ways of conceptualizing time in terms of space. So usually we have some idea of like forward, the front is the future and the past is behind. So we have this idea of this moving ego perspective where we're moving forward through time. So, for example, we're looking forward to Christmas or we're looking back on our birthdays or something like that. So the idea is we're moving along a straight line with the future in front. And that's that's called the moving ego perspective. We also have the moving time perspective in English. So that the idea here is you're stood still. And you've got time kind of coming up and washing over you, coming from the front and washing over you and going to the back. So here would be things like uh, Christmas is approaching or more likely like the exams are approaching or something. So things are coming at you and you've got no control. And so because of this, if we say in English, next Wednesday's meeting has been moved forward by two days, that could be Monday or it could be Friday. It, neither of them are wrong. Both of them are correct in English, which, as you can imagine, does lead to some confusion when people are arranging schedules uh, in, in, in when speaking British English. And one of the, the studies conducted by my, my colleague Bodo Winter, well, he simply modulated this by having what, a group of participants listen to this sentence and he gestured with his hand moving forward like this. And with another group of participants, it moved backwards like this to, re to reflect the two time perspectives, ways of ways of conceiving time in terms of space in English. And as you probably guessed, when people saw the gesture going like this, there were more. And he asked them to say, is it going to be on Monday or Friday? When, when, it, when, it, when it was moving forward, participants were more likely to say Friday, whereas when it was moving backwards, they were more likely to say Monday. So you can see here the, how we interact, there's, there's, a, there's a processing interaction of the language and the gesture, again, providing support for the embodied nature of metaphor. Um, and then and the final area of research involving gesture. Um, so on, on, on the top of this, this screen here, I was talking about changes motion and it'd be normal to see a gesture like this, weird to see a gesture like this. Uh, precision is tightness, normal to see a gesture like this, weird to see a gesture like this, for example. What Ibanez et al. did was they used um, some EEG research. So this is research where you have um, uh, electrodes attached to the brain to pick up um, sensitive movement, m uh, react responses in the brain to to particular stimuli. And they found that um, there was a, um, a response in the brain which suggested some kind of like shock or unexpectedness. So it's called an N400 in EEG. So an unexpectedness when people saw uh, the incongruent gestures. So when people saw, for example, like uh, changes motion or organization is physical structure. I'm doing the gestures here. I don't know if you can see that cut that, that that counter that contradict the, the metaphor. So we have some kind of wired in need to see gestures that are congruent with the metaphors that we encounter. So there are the three sources of evidence in support of an embodied metaphor. You've got behavioral studies, and I, I cited three. There are hundreds of these kinds of studies with very mixed levels of results, but generally very strongly providing behavioral support for the idea that metaphor is very strongly embodied. Then you've got the um, 
neurological studies, the, neuro, the neuroimaging studies, and finally the gesture studies. And then indeed, you've got um, famous researchers, um, Lakoff and Johnson, who I'm sure everybody is familiar with here, talking about if you are a normal human being, you inevitably acquire an enormous range of primary metaphors. And by that, they mean largely these, these conceptual metaphors, like a restricted set of them, just by going about the world constantly moving and perceiving. My issue in this talk, I'm going to take them to task on this, is this idea of a normal human being. Uh, I'm not quite entirely sure what a normal human being is, whether I'm a normal human being, whether we're normal human beings. Uh, I don't think anyone feels them, themselves are like completely normal. Everybody feels a little bit different in some way. And I think some of the issues with this theory are that they do kind of tend to lump everybody in together. They standardise things a little bit too much. So I'm going to be focusing on not normal, well, not not normal human beings, but all of us um, in my talk on variation in the experience of metaphor. And I'm going to be looking in roughly in two kinds of areas. So this, this idea of when and by whom are metaphors embodied, what I'm basically looking at is under what conditions and in what kinds of individuals are metaphors experienced at the physical level? So if you have an, idi an idiom like this, I've got your back, means I'm going to support you. It's unlikely that you're going to be interpreting it in this way, that somebody's actually physically got your back. <laughs> so that's that, that kind of expression possibly is likely to be processed on a kind of purely linguistic level, not necessarily on a physical level. And then we have a bit of a continuum. So Either you could you could process metaphor just purely at a linguistic level and it's not really embodied, or you can use your awareness of your body to kind of understand the metaphor, or at the strongest level, you are actually experiencing some kind of like physical response to the metaphor. So I'm interested in what what are the factors that make people move along this continuum from one end to another? Another way of thinking about it is when and under what conditions are metaphors activated? When are they actually kind of lived or experienced in a kind of like a physical way, as opposed to just being encountered as a as text and language? So I'm going to start off, I'm, I'm going to be looking at when and by whom, and I'm going to start off by looking at the when um, are metaphors embodied. And I'm, I'm going to argue that there are four contexts in which metaphors are more likely to be experienced in an embodied way. And the first one of these is um, emotion. Um, so the idea is that when metaphor is presented in an emotional context or when emotion is involved at some level in some way, metaphors are more likely to be experienced in an embodied way. There's a very nice study by Samur and, and colleagues who found that when metaphors were presented in an emotional context, there was more likely to be a neural response. So this is a kind of embodied, a kind of um, um, a physical response. So um, a, a motor, motor, a sensory, mo a sensory motor embodied response to the metaphors when they were presented in an emotional context than when they were presented in a non-emotional context. But this was not true of literal sentences, which is quite interesting. So it shows that um, when you present metaphor in an emotional context, there's more likely to be some kind of embodied sensory motor uh, response in, in the brain. Um, there's also studies which are not, not looking at inside the brain at all, but are just looking at the way people write about experiences. And there have been a number of studies uh, the Gibbs and Franks one is actually one of them, but others uh, by sim similar studies by different colleagues who also find that when people are describing emotional experiences, they're much more likely to use metaphor than when they are describing um, non-emotional experiences and that that varies according to the intensity of the emotion. So you see here we've got anger, sadness, pride and happiness. And in this study, Fussell, Fussell study, Fussell found that when people were describing intense emotions, people were much more likely to use some kind of metaphor. So this is something that I'm working on at the moment, uh, and I'm going to come back to it in a minute uh, with, a, with another study, showing that emotional experiences tend to lead to use of more metaphor, and arguably that met, that, that the Samura study um, suggests that they may be um, more likely to be experienced at, um, at on, on a kind of mo sensory motor level as well. <clears throat> 
The second thing accompanying emotion is novelty. Um, and again, there are studies showing that um, novel metaphors are processed in quite a different way from conventional metaphors, that they involve, again, more, more sensory motor activation and um, also um, more emotional response. Um, as an example of um, um, novelty and emotion, and in a study that I did, um, in, a in, in a recent study, looking at um, the use of metaphors by people describing their workplace experiences. And this is one of the, the books that Hong Xiao referred to in, in, the, um, in the introduction, um, a study where we interviewed a number of civil servants. So working for fairly high levels in the, in the government in the UK, describing their workplaces and we looked at their positive and negative evaluations of their workplaces. And of course, emotion is very, very heavily tied to evaluation. And we looked to see whether there was a, a correlation between evaluation, positive or negative, and the use of metaphor. And we found that the stronger the evaluation, the more the, there was more likely to be metaphor. And if the evaluation was negative, the metaphor was more likely to be novel. So this is quite interesting, I think. I, I, I've got the, the, the link to that on the next slide. So here we've got an example of one of the civil servants talking about describing his experience working for the civil service. This makes me not want to work for the government in the UK at any point in my life. So he says, I'm running on this soapy conveyor belt. That's the conveyor belt there. So it's kind of the idea of that, a thing that moves. And the idea, I suppose, is that's moving the opposite direction from the run, from the direction in which he's trying to run. And it's covered in soap, so it's really, really slippery. With people throwing wet sponges at me, and I've got this sodden great elastic band attached to my back. So I think he's making some reference here to this game, which I'm sure you have similar things in China. These ridiculous, humiliating games where people have to run along on inflatable things. It's very hard to do. They fall off. They fall in water. They have sponges thrown at them. It's soapy. They get soaking wet and they get into a mess. So this here, he's describing his workplace in a very, very humiliating way. So it's very physical. He's running along this conveyor belt trying to make progress. People are throwing sponges at him. So these are like things to make it even more difficult. And he's got this sodden great elastic band attached to his back. So not only is he running along this conveyor belt, but he's got something that's trying to pull him back and stopping him from making any progress. So it's really hard, very, very physical, very kind of embodied. And I don't know if you can also picture this scene here. And also it's almost physically experienced what he's going through. Whereas what he's actually describing is a very boring kind of job where he's like, you know, in a situation like this, um, just in, in the office in a suit, he's not really doing any of this at all. So, again, here we have, this is a quite an interesting metaphor because it, on the one hand, it's a very creative metaphor because not people don't normally compare their experience at work to running along soapy conveyor belts and having sponges thrown at them. But you'll see with me that it also also draws on a fairly conventional conceptual metaphor, the idea of moving forward in time is moving forward in space that I already mentioned. And you often find this, and indeed we often find this in this study, that it's very rare that you get a metaphor that's completely novel because on some level, and that can be varying degrees of abstraction at where this takes place, you have to draw on a conventional metaphorical mapping in order to make sense of it. Um, so as I was saying, we found in this study that the more emotional, the more negative the evaluation, the, the, the more likely participants were to use novel metaphors to describe their experiences. And they were very, very physical. So here's another couple. So here, the first person describes moving to a new department within the organisation. So someone described it to me, a former Treasury colleague as organ rejection, which is quite graphic, but I can see what she means. Now, this is quite interesting. So I'm sure... You've all experienced it. I've certainly experienced the thing where you, knew, you move to a new department, a new uh, a new situation, and you're all super keen and you want to make friends with everybody. And people are maybe not so friendly. They are kind of rejecting you a little bit. They're not including you in the department. And you feel a little bit rejected. But this person takes it to extremes and describes it as organ rejection. So this is like you are the, someone who's had a liver transplant, for example, and you are the liver that's arrived in their body and you're all ready to help them and, and make it make their body function well and the and the body rejects the organ so it expels the organ and doesn't want the organ 
So this is very strong. Again, it's a very physical reaction to the negative experience. And again, even though it's very, very creative, it does draw on a more conventional idea that the civil service itself is like a kind of a body. And we did see a lot of examples of metaphors along those lines. Another example of a metaphor that we found uh, to illustrate kind of a negative evaluation of somebody's experience. And this is an example of something that we found quite often was people mixing up different metaphors in some kind of vague way, but also, again, quite physical, quite embodied metaphor. So this, this person is talking about his former boss, his former head of department. And he said she did the traditional sort of chuck it all up in the air. So get the deck chairs and throw them in the air, cause chaos for a year and a half and then leave. And that's basically what she did. So this is a really interesting combination of metaphors here. So he's saying that his head of department, his boss was chaotic because she got things and threw them up in the air. But it's not just anything she threw in the air. It's deck chairs. And that's interesting because deck chairs, as you'll know, they are like the, like the summer chairs that we sit out in on the beach or in the summer uh, in the garden. I think what's going on here is an allusion to the idiom that we have in English to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. So this means that the Titanic, as you'll know, is a big ship that sank uh, beginning of the, the 20th century, a big cruise liner that sank in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. And the idea of organising the deck chairs on the Titanic means that a really majorly awful, dreadful thing is happening. But instead of addressing this absolutely terrible thing, you are obsessed with small, minor details around the edge and you're not really paying attention to the major the major thing that's happening. So rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic is this kind of slightly con idiom which you use to express contempt towards someone who's focusing on minor details when they should be focusing on the big issue. So here... What he manages to say about his head of department is that not only was she totally chaotic, but she was also obsessed with details unnecessarily. And here you've got this combination of, again, these two quite physical, potentially quite embodied metaphors. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, that book has just come out. So it's with me and Sarah Turner and Penny Tuck, who works in the business school at Birmingham University. It's Creative Metaphor Evaluation and emotion in conversations about work. Not the shortest, snappiest title, but um, that's that's available online as well, I think, that book. So coming back to this idea of when are metaphors likely to be embodied, we've talked about emotion and novelty. The third thing that I would like to argue is that when metaphors involve action, that's also another another time at which we're li more likely to experience them in an embodied way rather than the kind of more of a superficial way. And um, I've got uh, an example from a study that I conducted with, uh, well, it was led by my PhD student, Greg Woodin, but with also colleagues in the department, uh, Bodo Winter and Marcus Perlman, and also Tini Matlock from the, from the US. We looked at the ways in which um, gestures are used to describe things to do with high and low in the TV news archive. So I don't know if, you, if anyone is interested in studying gesture. The TV News Archive is a very, very good, it's a very useful resource. It's available free online. It's got thousands and thousands of hours of American TV news. And you can search for specific terms that are used. And then you can get a little extra to the video of the person using that term. So you can see how these terms accompany, are accompanied by different gestures. And so you can use that, look at the, them a lot to see if there are kind of general differences in the, in the kinds of gestures that are attracted by particular terms. And we were looking at high and low. And so we were looking at, for example, when someone talks about high standard or a low standard, how often do they use uh, gestures to to cut to 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 complement what they're saying? But we also, um, we so here we're looking at a high standard and a low standard. We also looked at a high number versus a low number because that's there's not actually there's, there's a bit less movement going on in number. And then crucially, we also looked at whether it was appearing in the verb, so lower the standard or raise the standard. And what we found was that. Yes, they are. These expressions are definitely very often accompanied by high and low gestures. But within when 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 they were when they were verbs rather than nouns, the gestures were more likely to go in line with the with the expression. So you can see here um, for low number, we for both for both low for both numbers and standards, 
we actually got more down gestures than up gestures, but the relative proportions changed according to whether it was low and high. And that's because when you're doing gesture studies and looking at high and low, it's very hard to filter out the beat gestures. So beat gestures are just the gestures when people are doing this, that like moving down to emphasize a point. It's very, very difficult to distinguish those from the actual high and low semantic meaningful gestures. But when we looked at lower the standard and raise the standard, the numbers are quite low here. So there's, there's not a strong, there's not st statistical significance. So more research is needed. But we found that it seemed to be that um, that, that the the number, the, the occurrences completely swap over. So with lower the standard, you've got a large number of down gestures. With raise the standard, they're much more likely to have the up gestures. And that's stronger for the verbs than it is for the nouns, suggesting that action may be a, a third um, element that's contributing to when metaphors are experienced in an embodied way. Because as I was saying before, uh, gesture is a good signal. It's a good indication of whether metaphors are being ex are used in an embodied way or not. And the fourth thing that I would like to argue emphasizes may affect whether metaphors are experienced in an embodied way is foregrounding. And by foregrounding, I mean drawing attention to the metaphor. Um, and I, in order to illustrate this, I've got a couple of findings from a study that I did where I got a colleague who works in one of the business departments at the University of Birmingham to describe various theories of business to um, people who, who were from her department and people from her outside her department, but also people who were native speakers of English versus people who were speakers of English as another, another language. And I found that when she was speaking to people who don't have English as their first language, she really, really exaggerated and foregrounded and emphasised a lot of her metaphors through the use of gesture. And here we've got, for example, um, she's talking about this one here, which is very centralised with a very kind of internal focus. And you see here she's kind of poking her finger down really strong, almost sound, sounding a little bit patronising here to emphasise it. Um, similarly, um, she talks about if you're looking at organisations, you're thinking about looking for jobs. So this is a kind of like metonymic use of looking for jobs. But here what's going on here are her glasses are coming off to indicate looking for jobs. So she made a lot of use of her glasses in a gestural way. She literally took her glasses off and moved them right out to the front to emphasize the looking for jobs. So here you've got the use of gesture, which is emphasizing this kind of like drawing attention to um, the metaphor or profiling or foregrounding the metaphor. And we have another really lovely example here where she's talking about how different parts of an organization work together. And she says, I suppose you could think of it as a piano. And then she has that, this is the left hand of the piano, keeping the old beat going and keeping the keys things. So I don't know if you can see my gesturing here, this left hand showing the beat. Of, and then she says, and this could be the fancy fiddly bits on the right hand side, the right hand of the piano, high notes is what she says here. And you'll notice here, that's interesting because you've got the piano metaphor going on, but you've also got another metaphor going on here because I don't know about you, but certainly any pianos that I've encountered are normally straight and flat like this. They're not, the right hand isn't right up in the air like this and the left hand isn't really low down. So what you've got here is the high notes and low notes also being enacted metaphorically. So again, she's trying to foreground it. She's trying to make a big point and she's using a lot of gesture. And what I found in this study is that the more she was trying to emphasize something, the more she was trying to foreground it, the more physical gestures came. I'm not the only one to have said this kind of thing. Um, in their um, book, uh, Metaphors, Dead and Alive, Sleeping and Waking, uh, Cornelia Muller and also her colleague Tag, Suzanne Tag, also talks about this idea of activated metaphoricity. So the idea here is the kind of the metaphor is woken up. So you remember that slide where the metaphors are all asleep and then one of them wakes up. This is this idea of metaphor suddenly becomes more alive, more active. And as I go through this talk, you'll notice that I'm using various terms that are all going to come together at the end, embodied, enacted, activated. Um, I'm going to be talking about the link between all these terms at the end of my talk. So that's the when a metaphor is likely to become embodied. Moving on now to the, um, well, this is, so the, argue, the argument is that we've got um, met, um, emotion, novelty, action and foregrounding. The next thing is the 
by whom you'll see we're still in the second blob here so i said i'll give you an update of how far through the, the talk we are so the next thing is the by whom i'm coming back to lake up and johnson so they talk about this normal human being idea which i think is a little bit problematic but in other work they also talk in, in even worse terms about the prototypical person. I don't know about you, but I am sure I have never met a prototypical person. I'm not sure if I'd want to be ever described as a, as a prototypical person. Normal conceptual system, natural kinds of experience. And I think that what we're looking at here, this prototypical normal person is probably a middle-class, white, Western, right-handed, cisgender, non-disabled man. I would argue, um, English speaking, of course. So I think when you when you bring in all the other world experiences, then this starts to be problematic. And there are indeed studies that have looked at some basic aspects of variation across individuals that lead to um, variation in the ways in which people experience metaphor. Um, there's really nice work, again, by Daniel Casasanto, um, who's done some really lovely work looking at the effect of, the effect of handedness on the metaphor that we have in English. And I don't know if you have this in Chinese, that right is good and left is bad. So we have kind of like a right-hand man is someone who supports the person in power, or you're even right, you know, it's the same spelling, right and wrong. Whereas left-handed, you have the word gauche, which is the French for left, and it means clumsy, or you have um, sinister, which also means left, which means bad and evil, dexterous, which is to be uh, capable of doing things, which is the Latin word for right. So we have this inbuilt um, attitude, uh, evaluation of right is good and left is bad. In order to test whether this was actually true of people who are left-handed, because it's interesting, this is based on the idea that we use our right hand for most things. Casasanto was interested to see, do people who are left-handed also have this kind of the bias towards uh, right is good and left is bad? And in order to test this, what he did was um, he had a, a, a rather intriguing study where he had um, people imagine that they were going to a zoo and they were given a, a piece of paper with two boxes on it, two boxes drawn on it, and they were to illustrate uh, two different cages. And they were told they're going to see the lions and the zebras, for example, and that they love lions, but they absolutely hate zebras for some particular reason. And they, they were asked to draw which just draw randomly one of the animals in each of the cages on the page. And the idea was that people who were right-handed were more likely to draw the nice animal on the right and the nasty animal on the left. And what he did, and that for people who were left-handed, the, the tendency would be less marked. And this is indeed what he found. So he found that right, there was a tendency across the board to put the good the, the good animal on the right and the bad animal on the left, but the, the tendency was significantly stronger in right-handed individuals than it was in left-handed individuals, which suggests that uh, there is this strong correlation, but it varies according to uh, people. So it does vary across individuals. Um, religious belief is, a, is another area where we've got variation. So as I was saying, um, as I've said a couple of times during the talk, we have this idea that uh, moving forward in time is moving forward in space. And you get this a lot in, in religion as well. You're moving with God or you're moving towards God. And my student, uh, Peter Richardson, what he found, he compared uh, Christianity with Islam. And one of the things that he observed in his uh, interviews with people talking about their relationship with God is that in Christianity, people are more likely to be moving towards God Whereas in Islam, they're more likely to be moving with God. So you've got the same metaphor, but manifesting in different ways according to religious beliefs. And for cultural and linguistic background, there's a lot of research in this area. I'm not going to go into the details here. One of the big proponents of this is Andreas Musov, who's featuring there laughing on, on the slide. Uh, about the idea that um, metaphors vary significantly according to the linguistic background of the speaker. And I've done some research myself with, with, with colleagues looking at how metaphorical meanings of colour vary hugely according to cultural and linguistic background. And then the, 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 the relationships cannot always be explained in embodied terms when you ask people to explain why they have these links. So there, there's sort of three areas where there's been established research. Um, in the metaphors in the mind book, where I, I think a picture of that popped up on the previous slide, I identify a number of areas, uh, a number of things that shape the ways in which metaphor is experienced differently across individuals. 
don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of these right now. I'm just going to pick out two or three just to illustrate a few things which I think are particularly interesting and studies that I've done showing the differences. So the first one, gender, um, there's, as I was saying, one of the, I think one of the, the factors that one of the characteristics of these kind of normal prototypical people that have probably shaped these metaphors is the fact that they're probably male. Whereas I think it's interesting to look at women's responses to some of the conceptual metaphors that have been argued as kind of being universal. And one of the conceptual metaphors that is very, very, very strong is this idea of like hierarchy where powerful is up and not powerful is down. And it's been argued that this comes from our experiences of children where our parents are way above us and adults are way above us in height and they have power to do to tell us to do what they want us to do, whereas we are small and we don't have power. And there's a study by um, Schubert, which is an interesting study where they simply look at, uh, put um, uh, words of combinations of people on the screen, a king and a servant, and they ask which has more power. Obviously, here it's the king, but in some of the configurations, it's the other way up. So the question, which has more power? Obviously it still stands, it's still the king, but it takes people longer to process it and longer to reply when they are in the non the incongruent condition like this, which is the opposite to what you'd expect. So we've got the congruent condition and the incongruent condition here. Um, this this similar idea has been investigated to do with valence as well. So whether happy is up and sad is down, whether people are asked to find, um, to, to, to read words, to describe whether words are real words or not real words in English, and they're shown in the congruent condition, and sometimes they're shown in the incongruent condition. And again, it takes people longer or people make more mistakes when they're shown in the incongruent condition. Um, similarly, with memory for objects, so people have been found to remember positive um, pictures when they're at the top of the screen and remember negative pictures when they're at the bottom of the screen. When they're in the reverse uh, condition, they find it hard to remember them. So this is kind of a well-established big body of research looking at this vertical orientation. We were interested in looking at whether when you factor in gender, does that make a difference? So... Um, You've got the king and the servant. What if you replace that with male teacher, female pupil? So we have this, I'm sure you have it in China as well, this, this stereotype that men have more power than women or more important than women, so on and so forth. So the, the conventional thing, the expected congruent thing would be that they would be at the top of the screen, uh, be processed more quickly, understood more quickly, whereas females at the bottom of the screen will be, will be processed more slowly. And that that would interact with power so teacher, pupil. So this would be the most congruent condition. Whereas if you swap it over, you've got female pupil and male teacher. That would be the least congruous condition. And in between, you've got things like female teacher, male pupil at the top and the bottom of the screen. So in our study, we were interested in looking at does this does the position of the screen affect the, the time taken to pe for people to make the decision about who has more power? And does the gender affect uh, the, the perceptions of power? Sadly, we found that yes, it does. So we found that um, there is an effect for the position on the screen and it interacts with gender and people are more readily, quickly, quick to, to find, to, to answer the question when it's male and when it's teacher at the top and when it's female and pupil at the bottom. I should say this is in, in this study and the three that I've just mentioned, this is just one item. Of course, we used about sort of uh, a large number of items in, in this study, as all the studies did. And what was even sadder was we found that the bias was stronger in male participants than in female participants. And also what was even sadder was we did this on the kind of 18 to 22 year olds, uh, so university students. And I was kind of hoping that maybe university students would have uh, maybe a little bit uh, of a more broad or a more inclusive um, view of gender roles in the UK, but turns out that that's not the case. So that's the, that's the first one. I, I'm gonna show you just, um, just three examples of this variation across individuals. And the second one relates to sensory deficits and surpluses. So sensory deficits would be things like blindness. So um, the, the, the interesting question of like, 
we have like this idea of seeing is understanding or understanding is seeing in English, how our blind people are affected by that. And there's been some interesting studies showing there is a kind of effect or um, other, the idea that kind of like able-bodied is means good and correct. Like how do disabled people respond to this? But actually I'm going to look now at what I, what I refer to as a sensory surplus. So a sensory deficit is where one of the, one of the senses is not working as well as it ought to be. A sensory surplus is perhaps when you've got maybe a little bit too much sensory response. And the condition that I'm going to talk about here is a condition known as synesthesia. And I don't know whether you're uh, uh, familiar with this condition. Basically, um, in all languages and in all, in all cultures, we can cross senses. So we can talk about one sense in terms of another. So we can talk, for example, about a sharp cheese. So there you've got uh, the sense of touch being used to describe the sense of taste. Or we can talk about a loud jacket. So that means that the color of the jacket is really, really bright. And so we use a sense of sound to refer to the color. So here we've got uh, sound and sight being crossed. So everybody can do a bit of synesthesia to some extent, but there's a small part of the population. And I think it's about three to 5% of the population that have involuntary cross sensory activation that they cannot help and it happens all the time. And there have been neurological studies of these um, individuals. Um, I'm just going to get it here. That shows that the in the in the brains of people who have synesthesia, the amygdala, which is responsible for the emotion processing of emotions, is strongly connected with the sensory cortex. So senses trigger emotions more strongly, and they cross them over more often. Here's an example of uh, from a, a novel, which is actually a, a nice novel set in Birmingham, astonishing splashes of color, where the protagonist in the novel, the main character in the novel, has this condition of synesthesia. And she's talking in the book about how she feels about her current new boyfriend, who she's very excited about having met him. And she says, there are only certain times when I feel right and he feels right, then his white slows down so that all the yellows and blues and reds in his spectrum meet mine and merge, complementing the frenetic worlds of colour inside me. We look at each other and we match. Things can only work if we can share the colours out properly and evenly between us. So this is a very unusual way of talking about emotions, um, but she's seeing the emotions. She's, she's experiencing these emotions in a very, very visual way because of her condition of synesthesia. Another very famous synesthete was the artist um, Kandinsky, and I don't know if you're familiar with, the, with this with this with this artist. He could see music, so when he heard music, he actually saw things in response to the music, and then he drew what he saw. And so this is one of his famous paintings called Musical Overture, and his description of this painting is this. So he says, "I saw all my colours and spirit before my eyes." Wild, almost crazy lines were sketched in front of me. The sound of colours is so definite that it would be hard to find anyone who would express bright yellow with bass notes or dark uh, dark lake with treble. So you see here, he's got this strong synesthesia between sound and sight. So one of the things I'm interested in is with people with, with, with people who have synesthesia, do they experience embodied metaphors in a different way from uh, people who don't have synesthesia? And perhaps even more interesting, what does that tell us about embodied metaphor itself? What is it about these people that makes them experience uh, embodied metaphors in different ways? So in a study that um, was also mentioned by Hong Xia in, in the introduction, a study with, with Sarah Turner, one of the things we did was we got a group of um, synesthetes and a group of non-synesthetes uh, who were recruited online through various forums. And we had them do two tasks. In the first task, we gave them some expressions in English that are basically just expressions, but they have a potential embodied nature to them. And the expressions are things like this. So the sound of fingernails on a chalkboard set my teeth on edge. Or seeing those people again made my skin crawl. So you see this very physical nature of these idioms. It made me sick, feel sick to see such meaningless cruelty. Or their constant excuses left a bad taste in my mouth. And we asked the synesthetes and the non-synesthetes simply to say how literal 
do, do these things feel to you? How do you literally actually feel that your skin is crawling or that you feel sick or your teeth are on edge or you have a bad taste in your mouth? And we found that the synesthetes um, were significantly more, these, these expressions were significantly more literal for the synesthetes than for the non-synesthetes, uh, suggesting, first of all, that synesthetes experience metaphor in a more embodied way, in a more physical way than non-synesthetes. And then what's interesting is we also found that the synesthetes were more likely to produce more metaphors in response to um, a request to describe sensory experiences. So in the second part of the study, what we asked them to do was to describe something they love to see, smell, taste, touch and hear, and something that they really hate to see, smell, taste, touch and hear. And we looked at the kind of responses that they produced. And we found a huge amount of what really looked like really, really, really creative metaphor. We also found a huge amount of emotion references to emotion in the synesthetes. We found extreme, like hyperbolic responses in the synesthetes. We found references to kind of physical responses. So it really, really makes my brain hurt. And we found references to personification, so where the objects became personified. So one of the things that we argue in this book is there's this cluster of characteristics that leads, that leads people to produce very, very physical creative metaphor, that they all kind of work together. And so here are some of the examples of things that the synesthetes produced. So his voice melts my mind, it makes me warm, it looks like deep, dark colours, and it is my favourite sound. So... Interestingly, the strong evaluation here, but this almost beautiful, this poetic metaphor that they're using in response to describe somebody's voice. We have another example. I hate the flute so much. I don't like how airy it is. I get lightheaded when thinking about it. The colour of the sound is a terrible, obnoxious baby blue. So here in both of these examples, we have this cr sensory crossing over between uh, sound and sight which leads to the production of metaphor. But intervening in here, we have a strong emotional reaction to the stimulus uh, and an extreme reaction in both cases, I would say as well. And then third one, a song I listened to the other day, the background music was annoying like a twitch or trying to zip an old metal zipper that keeps getting caught. So here, this person is linking this sound to trying to the physical, so, so, so the kind of the touch experience of trying to, to do up an, an, an old zip and it won't do. So again, this cross sensory metaphor, quite creative, again with emotion and again with a kind of a strong reaction to the stimuli. So what we suggest is these things kind of consolidate in order to um, to lead to creativity. And we also suggest that maybe when people are in these situations in their everyday life, so going back to the civil servants talking about their workplace experiences, people have a strong emotional reaction to an experience and it drives them to produce what looks like a very creative use of metaphor. So there's um, a couple of the sources of variation uh, across individuals that lead um, I would argue that leads to variation in the use of, um, in the embodied nature of metaphor. The third one I just want to mention very briefly is a study that we're conducting at the moment and we're just in the process of analyzing the data. Um, what we did here was we asked children to um, respond to what, for adults will be very, very, very conventional metaphors. So, um, for example, we had them listen to a major chord and a minor chord and draw what they responded to, what they thought were the major chord sounded like and what they thought the minor chord sounded like. And we found that the adults would just draw kind of like a, maybe a happy play, happy face for the major chord, a, a, a very unhappy place for, face for the, net, for the minor chord, whereas the children did all sorts of very, very, very varied things that were quite different. Um, also, we had things like... Um, music like high and low notes and we asked people to draw like where they were on the page and the, the adults would do very 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 conventional things whereas the children would do much more varied things and they related them much more to their own personal experiences so for example uh, so the children when they're describing music but there's also with also applied to to numbers and it also applied to time and it also applied to emotion 
The children made significantly more use of cross-sensory metaphor, personal experiences and narratives, and were more literal. So as, uh, as I was saying, like, like the synesthetes in a way, experiencing things in a more embodied way. So here we have like a, a, a response from a, from a child describing a major chord and a minor chord in this way. This one sounds like a bell. And this one sounds like when you're dead. <laughs> so here it's much more kind of like a physical thing, a, a kind of lived experience rather than a kind of very mundane thing like the adults produce. Um, also, this is another one in response to staccato and legato. Adults would just draw four dots and four lines. So dots for staccato, lines for legato. Whereas the children, we've got things like this one is like a leopard. So what we've got here in the children's experiences, we've got much more creative metaphor, potentially more embodied metaphor, metaphors that relate to their own personal experiences than in the adults. So what we're finding from this study, and we haven't finished analysing the data yet, is that metaphor is much more alive for these children. There's much more metaphorical personification of the stimuli than there was for the adults as well. So metaphor is kind of alive and kicking in these children, whereas in the adults, it's kind of died and it's become kind of conventional. Um, but it's still there to be shaped. And so I think what this tells us a little bit is how adults start to acquire these very conventional metaphors that we have to for talking about number, time, music and so on and so forth. So there are the three things that I wanted, wanted to mention briefly in terms of the variation across individuals. Um, now I'm going to move into the one of the first of the two applied parts of, of, of the research that I've done. And this 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 relates to stress and depression as another source of variation across individuals. So this is the part of the talk where I warn you, some of the examples are a little bit hard hitting and a little bit uncomfortable. But I think it's very interesting to apply metaphor research to this to this area. And this is our research on the use of embodied metaphor in in um, when people have experienced pregnancy loss. So. Um, we use pregnancy loss to, as, 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 a, as a broad term to, to describe a miscarriage or um, um, termination for, for a fetal anomaly or stillbirth. People who've lost a, a baby before it's, before it's been really uh, been born. And we were interested in this study. So this study, I worked with colleagues from uh, the, uh, the School of Law um, and also from cultural studies. Um, and also with people in, in nursing to look at what it to, to to attempt to use metaphor to access the experience of pregnancy loss. And this goes back a little way to what I was saying at the beginning about how people tend to use metaphor when they're describing emotional situations. So this is the study here. Um, the study, as I as I said, it was conducted with with colleagues from different departments partly because there are interesting um, issues, legal issues around what the hospital and is and isn't allowed to do with a, with a, with a stillborn fetus and with a, a miscarried fetus and how and whether the parents are allowed to have a, a burial or a cremation for the fetus. So that's why the, that's why there was there was law involved. But also there was a, a big scandal in the UK a few years before we started this project at a hospital in Liverpool, where people who had had um, they had had um, miscarriages and the the, 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 the fetuses had been taken away and they'd been told that the fetuses would be um, would be treated with respect um, and um, cremated. Whereas actually what happened was the fetuses were taken to a lab and they were experimented on and people did all sorts of things with these fetuses. And when the parents found out, they were understandably extremely upset. So the UK government created in response to that an organisation called the Human Tissue Authority, whose um, role was to legislate about what people could do uh, with fetuses. But in order to kind of like feed into some of their legislation, it's very useful to get the views of the parents who've experienced the pregnancy loss, to get their lived experiences so that the, the law can accurately reflect the experiences of the parents. And that was the aim of our study. So, um, so understanding and supporting choices made by people who've experienced miscarriage, termination and, and stillbirth. 
These were the partners in our study. So very strong relationship with the Human Tissue Authority that I just mentioned, but also other organisations that support people who've had various forms of, of pregnancy loss. And the overall aims of the study were this. So to examine the law surrounding choice and informed consent following pregnancy loss and the ways in which it's interpreted. And then the bit where I came in, where the language and linguistics and the metaphor came in, to examine the narratives of women and those who support them, focusing on metaphor as a commonly used resource for expressing the inexpressible. So it has been argued, and I think it's also been shown, that when people experience um, something which is different from what other people have experienced, their pregnancy loss is not widely talked about, it's not a commonly shared experience, even though a lot of people actually do experience it. Um, there are no words to share the experience, no literal words. So people reach for metaphor in order to describe the experience. So my bit was to examine the, the metaphors that people use to describe their experiences. And so what we did in this study, we, we interviewed um, um, people and their part, women and their partners who had experienced miscarriage and termination uh, and stillbirth, a number of people who provide support for them, and interestingly, the majority of those people who worked for those organisations, those charities who support them, had also experienced some kind of pregnancy loss themselves. Um, we interviewed bereavement mid midwives, who are people whose role is to focus particularly on giving birth to um, to 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 fetuses that have died. So one of the things that's recommended that people do is that they, when when a baby dies inside them, that they actually give birth naturally because that helps them bond with the with the child and it helps them it helps the the recovery process afterwards rather than having a cesarean for example and then funeral directors um as well and then when we were interviewing the people who'd experienced pregnancy loss we were looking we asked them about ex the experience itself but also the decision making and the communication that they'd received around the loss and so we coded all of our interviews um, using uh, a piece of software that allows us to, to identify main themes and major metaphors. And we identified about, I don't know, probably about 30 topics and about 80 different types of metaphors uh, that people use to talk about the experience. And then we use the metaphors to gain insight into what the experience was actually like. Um, here are some examples. So some of the topics will be receiving the diagnosis, making decisions about the pregnancy, making decisions about memorialization, but also like the feeling of the pregnancy loss itself and how people would describe it to others who have perhaps not experienced it. And then in terms of the metaphors, here are some examples of the kinds of metaphors we found. People used metaphors that referred to like journeys or being in a physical space or entering or leaving a space or falling apart or sometimes feeling invisible, not literally so, but um, uh, metaphorically so, moving up and down. These are some of the examples of the metaphorical fields that were identified. Um, and I think I'm not going to go into detail of all the metaphors, but I'm just going to give a few insights into some of the key headline findings from that study in terms of what our metaphor analysis told us about the experience of pregnancy loss. And I think something that's very, very relevant to this talk is the experiences is an extremely embodied experience, but embodied on a metaphorical level and on a literal level at the same time. So we had a lot of people saying things like this. Emptiness inside of us, which is very physical as well as emotional. So you see the emotional is actually metaphor there. Uh, so here, this is a different, this show that's kind of like a different kind of reality, a different kind of experience from other kinds of grief, because there's an emptiness which is inside, which is which is physical as well as emotional. And we have many, many, many examples of this. Uh, it's not like losing a parent. I've lost grandparents, even friends that have died, but it's not like that because it's part of you and he's part of me. So people feel like they've lost part of themselves and then they try to rebuild themselves. So the, um, the the embodied nature of the experience and the the depth of the of grief. Sometimes people argue that uh, pregnancy loss is perhaps is not as difficult as losing a living child because you've never met the child. But actually, our findings show that it, it was the grief is extremely strong for these parents, and they they need time to grieve and they need time to mourn the loss of their of their baby.
A second thing that the metaphor analysis told us related to a kind of divided self in a way. Um, so people would see that they, that they would kind of like separate their mind and their body. So mind body separation going on here. So you'd have things like it had been several weeks already that my body hadn't caught on that I'd need to have some sort of. An self from her body almost. We also had things like people saying the sensible part of my brain was saying this, the emotional part of my brain was saying that. And so there's this split between the two parts of the brain. Again, very, very metaphorical. Um, and then we've got these other things like the body keeping hold of babies that it shouldn't do because it did that four times. So again, we've got this kind of like this divided self splitting between the mind and the body. Or I knew my body could do what it had to do. But interestingly, we saw that when people had separated themselves from their bodies, they could then blame their bodies for what had happened. So here we have like a my primary feeling, the first feeling is that my body had failed me totally. So this body is kind of personified as something with its with its own agency, kind of independent of the person who's occupying the body, and it had failed them totally. Here we have another example. This person got a whole range of emotions feeling from being really angry with my body and myself. So my body and myself, you see two separate things there, not knowing that it was happening and for my body for letting me down. So this is interesting for some people. It was it was a kind of like um, a negative thing. But for other people, it was kind of perhaps more of a positive thing. They could blame their body, whereas they, they don't have to actually blame themselves because there's an awful lot of blame that goes on when people have had pregnancy loss. People blame themselves for what's happened. And similarly, mine stopped growing at six weeks, but I was 12 to 13 weeks pregnant because my body hadn't realised that nothing was happening. So the metaphor analysis told us things about people's attitudes towards their, their, their body and their kind of their blaming of the, of the, of the body for, for what had happened. It also told us some interesting things about time and people's conceptions of time. So do you remember when I when I at the beginning when I was talking about the the moving ego and the moving uh, time perspective? So either you could be moving through time or you just stand still and time is washing over you where you don't have agency. We expected to have we so we coded our data for metaphors that corresponded to um, uh, the moving ego and metaphors that corresponded to the moving time perspective. We expected to find a lot of metaphors that corresponded to the moving time perspective because this shows a lack of agency. So we expected things like this, and this is one of the examples, as we watched the seconds turn into hours, days, weeks, even months, things for us felt help, hopeless. Um, and so we interest, we're interested in looking at that. Is it the case that there is more um, moving moving time metaphor because that would that would give us a, an indication and, and a, an insight into how much control and how much power the parents felt they had over the whole situation. Interestingly, we didn't find much of either of those. Um, but what we did find more was uh, this idea of being outside the timeline completely. And we found this quite a lot in our data. So with things like this, so it's hard to come out of the hospital because the world is still carrying on, but your world has stopped. So this, this dissociation between the rest of the world and what these parents are going through was very, very strong and very, very marked metaphorically in their, in their metaphorical use of language. Or you've got things like this. In an instant, your whole world, your family, your life spiral out of your control. You're a bystander to your fate and future with no power to help your loved ones. So again, this idea of being outside the rest of the world. And it's very interesting this because we found that um, when we talked to the midwives, the bereavement midwives, some of them were very, very aware of this metaphoric experience that the parents were going through and that they used it and they embraced it when they were talking to the parents, when they're communicating to the parents about the, the experience and the decisions that they may have to make during the experience. And here's a quote from one of the midwives that we uh, that we interviewed. So she says, if the world is going round, that's the world you know. And then when you have a baby that's died, you get off. You know the world is still going round. And then as time goes on, you know, you might go round a couple of times and then get off again, get on again, and then gradually you'll get back on. But you have to do it at your own pace. So it's kind of dipping in and out, you know. And that's a really, really nice example of how she says to the parents, 
you know, you will feel like it's almost like there's a kind of like a merry-go-round or a carousel going around and you may feel like it's going around too fast for you and you need to get off and take things in your own time but you can get back on when you feel like it's got this other metaphor dipping in and out so getting on and off the the merry-go-round as you feel capable and i think this is a really nice example of the idea that healthcare professionals can you listen to the metaphors that the that the that the bereaved are using and then use those metaphors back in ways with them that kind of extend them and reflect their own experience and there's been research in um in in therapy by particularly by Dennis Tay in Hong Kong that shows this is a very powerful strategy to help people use their own metaphors extend them and elaborate them but work with them and listen to the people listen to the language of the the people who are bereaved also on the compression of time also on the issue of time one of the things that came up very very strongly is that people need to when people have a a baby that's died or uh, or a miscarriage they or particularly if they've got um, a baby who is stillborn they need to compress the whole of that baby's life into the few hours or maybe the few days that they can spend with the baby so often a lot of the support for people who've been through pregnancy loss is about building some kind of memories that they have with the child with the child's but so the time they spend with the child's body before it's buried or cremated and that is really really important time for a lot of the parents because they need to build these memories that they're going to look back on to support them through the, the grieving process later on and we had a particularly um powerful um quotation from from two of the, the midwives again who were talking about how um a father of a stillborn baby in the UK we have this kind of tradition where on the on the 18th birthday maybe a father will take his son out for his first drink in the pub uh, um, and he will kind of like celebrate the child being 18 or we also have this idea of wetting the baby's head which is kind of like it's a, it's a metaphorical expression meaning go out drinking with your friends to celebrate the birth of the baby but this father was going to miss this kind of like this idea that he would never be able to have a, a beer with with his boy because he died and so what they said was this, so that the baby's, the baby's body was still there and he could spend time with the baby. And so they, they did this. So we had a dad who's always wanted beer and he said, I want a can of beer, dad and lad. So we facilitated that. Yeah, he wanted a can of beer with his son and sadly his son was stillborn. So we let him have some beer in the family room with his baby. So what they did here was they let him have this metaphorical, it was a literal beer, but what was metaphorical was the, was the having his beer with his son in the way he would have done well on his son's 18th birthday, the first time he was allowed to go into the pub. And he enacted this. So this is a kind of a metaphorical enactment that helps the father create the memories that he'll need to draw on to bring him through the, the, the loss later on. And so the, the midwife goes on to say, yes, he dreamt the dream and that's his memory. So I think from then we learned that this is the time to capture the memories so now when I do speak to families, I say to them, is there a dream that you're dreaming? And let's do it. And what she's referring to here, and we had lots of examples of this, are in fact, they're enacted metaphors. They're, so they're kind of like their, their behavior, which is not kind of literally true behavior, but it's metaphorical enactment of things that then they're going to be able to draw on later on. So we had a lot of this. Um, and so talking to the parents and to these these very, very successful midwives, and also talking to the parents about kind of more successful and less successful communication, we were able to develop a, to develop a number of training materials for healthcare professionals and funeral professionals and others who support people through pregnancy loss. Um, so there were, for example, there were good examples like this with the, with the midwives who let the father have the beer, but there was another rather sad example of a woman who had a stillborn baby and she wanted to take the baby out to see the stars um, so that she could imagine that she'd shown the baby the stars. But unfortunately, the, the, the midwives were, did not facilitate that and did not let her do it. And so she always has this memory, memory of not being allowed to do something that she really, really wanted to do. So we drew on all of this work. And this is just some of the examples, but there's a lot more of the stuff about the examples of the, the experience of pregnancy loss and what constituted successful and less successful communication. And we developed, first of all, we developed um, um, a couple of training courses 
in, co in collaboration with the Royal College of Midwives, and this is the national organization that supports supports midwives, one on um, uh, expressing choice or conveying choice to people who've had uh, different kinds of pregnancy loss, and the other on communication more generally following pregnancy loss. Um, we fed uh, into the National Bereavement Care Pathway. So this is advice that's given to hospitals right across England on how to care for people who've had different kinds of pregnancy loss. Um, we fed into guidance um, developed by the Human Tissue Authority, the Department of so Health and Social Care, and we've written a number of articles in um, journals, professional and academic journals relating to this. And then we've also created materials for funeral directors uh, in collaboration with the National Association of Funeral Directors and the Federation of Burial and Cremation Authorities, so interactive online materials on how to communicate with people who've experienced pregnancy loss and how to organise a funeral for for their for their children. So this is like this this research is drawn off the off the pregnancy loss study, but also we did a a smaller study later on looking at parents whose children had died who were, who were older children, and we combined the two sets of research to feed into these materials. Um, and these have been quite widely used across the, across the UK, these materials. So that's the first application. And it's really nice to see kind of people being interested in metaphors. One of the things that's quite interesting is we, at first of all, we thought, oh, the Royal College of Midwives and the National Association of Funeral Directors, they're gonna be interested in general stuff, but they're not gonna be interested in metaphors, but actually they are extremely interested in metaphors because it's the kind of it's the kind of piece of the jigsaw that they don't know about and the new way of seeing things that kind of provides insight into the ways in which people are experiencing the, bere the different kinds of bereavement. So we were pleased to see metaphor being appreciated outside the metaphor community. So that's the rather sad study. Moving on now to something that's perhaps a little bit lighter. It's the fourth blob on my on my talk, embodied metaphor uh, and advertising. And here, if you remember this chart here, we've looked at variation across metaphors and variation across individuals. Here, the focus is on implementing the variation across metaphor stuff in actual live campaigns and testing the effectiveness of those campaigns, drawing on some of the theory that I mentioned in the first part of this talk. So the theory that comes from my own research, but also from the research of others as well. Um, and the study that I'm going to talk about in particular um, was conducted in collaboration with um, the Big Cat Advertising and Communications Agency, um, and Anthony Tatum there is the, uh, the managing director of that. And also uh, uh, Birmingham Safeguarding Children's Partnership, which I'll come to a bit later on. Um, and actually, no, the Safeguarding Children's Partnership, that's a slightly different thing, which I will come to later. That's, that's not part of this study, but it's part of this general area of applying um, metaphor in, in advertising. Um, I put a picture of him there because we worked very, very closely with him. We had a... Um, a, very, a, a nice situation that is set up now in the UK where you can have a PhD student who sits at the intersection between academia and uh, kind of the world outside academia. So I had a PhD student who's just just graduated very recently, Samantha Ford, who did a PhD which was half with me and half working with the agency. And so we were working with him about and looking at how to implement metaphor findings into the campaigns that he runs in order to make them more successful. And we talked about things like embodied metaphor and enacted metaphor and activated metaphor. And he never really kind of like got it, what it was we were talking about until suddenly it came to him and he said, actually, I know what you mean. What you mean is this. You mean how powerfully metaphor engages people. And we think, yes, that's what we're interested in. So one of the things that we learned about this is when we're talking about metaphor to people outside of academia, we need to adjust the vocabulary that we, that we use in order to make it fit their needs and, and what they're interested in. And of course, because he's in advertising, he wants to engage the, the, the viewers of the advertisements. And so therefore he wants to look at um, how engaging it is. And so based on the research that I mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk, we're interested in the idea that um, metaphor is in likely to engage people more powerfully. And in our terms, we mean it's a kind of experienced at an embodied level. So it's a more physical level. So it's much stronger when it's novel, when it involves action and when it involves emotion and empathy. And so one of the 
the big studies that we did with him draws on the first two of these, uh, novelty and involving action. And this is a campaign that we did for, um, ah, yeah, this is, this is the other thing I meant to say, the novelty, the fact that the metaphor requires more work in order to be worked out if it's novel than if it's conventional. That's quite an important thing that comes 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 out in this campaign. Um, but one of the, the but the campaign that we focused on with him was um the Umbrella Birmingham and Solihull Sexual Health Clinic. So these are people who provide support for people who have or think that they may have a sexually transmitted um infection. And they need to provide campaigns because 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 talking about sexual health is a bit of an embarrassing thing in the UK. I, I think it probably is in China as well. People are a bit awkward talking about it. You want a campaign that attracts attention that people really, really notice, but that they can talk about. So if you see an advert for a sexual health clinic and you're with a friend or you're with your boyfriend, you're unlikely to, to point it out and say, well, that's but that's good, isn't it? unless perhaps it's a bit funny or a bit quirky or a bit memorable. So they were, the, what the Umbrella Sexual Health Clinic were interested in doing was creating a campaign that uh, drew people's attention, was funny, was witty, but was also a little bit shocking. And that's why I put the exclamation mark, because some of the examples are a little bit rude, a bit risque, so apologies in advance for that. But I think the aim was deliberate to shock people into noticing the posters and the online content so that they would make use of their services and get treated for infections. Just to provide a bit of context, um, there are a lot of sexually transmitted infections in England. So this is 2018 figures, 447,694, an increase by 5% on the previous year. So there's a need to get people treated to sort of, and also to prevent people from catching them in the first place. That's one of the other things that the clinic does. So what they aim to do in the campaign that we worked on them with, we worked on with them, was to take place names of places in and around Birmingham. So this is a local campaign in Birmingham and the West Midlands. And to give those names a kind of double entendre, give them an extra little twist to make them a little bit different and to make them noticeable. And so they had things like this. So apologies in advance because some of these are a little bit rude. So these are the kind of things that they were looking at. And we had we actually had great fun sitting with them and working with them on these on these on these posters. So there's a place in Birmingham called Digbeth, but you can split that into two words. Dig Beth means do you like the woman called Beth? It's kind of very conventional idea. Do you dig Beth? Do you like Beth? So this is the idea here that this might lead to some kind of like romantic or sexual encounter with Beth. Again, Touchwood is the name of a shopping centre in Birmingham, and going to Touchwood is a, a name for male masturbation. So again, there's this rude double meaning of Touchwood. Um, Acox Green, Acox Green is a part of Birmingham, and I won't go into the detail of this, but this is kind of, you can probably look it up later on. This is kind of like the results of having had uh, a sexual transmitted uh, infection and maybe the colour of, of the way in which put somebody's penis goes so obviously they're very rude but they're very shocking i mean that's i that, that's the idea that people look at them and then they look at them again and think oh my god and then they may joke about them with the person that they're with so we were interested in looking at the factors we the, they had a lot of candidates because there are a lot of places in and around birmingham that are susceptible or are good candidates for double entendres for jokes like this and we were responsible for helping them to select the really really good ones and I'll come in a minute to the criteria that we tested for the selection of the good adverts. But just as a, as a preamp, preamp to that, in the study, we showed participants a number of these adverts. We had a lot. We had 355 participants. Uh, this is an online study using Prolific, which is kind of um, it's a very nice survey software where you can select particular types of participants. So we could select West Midlands only, different age groups, have it roughly balanced for gender, male and female, and so on and so forth. Um, the study was created in Qualtrics, um, which is um, just a sort of survey, so it's like elaborate survey de design. And then we analysed the findings in W Matrix, which allows you to identify. So we asked people to respond to different adverts in terms of like how effective they thought they were, but also 
how um, to write about what they thought the adverts meant and why they were effective. So we used W Matrix and AntConc, which are both corpus linguistic software, which allowed us to pull out different responses from different age groups, from male and female, and so on and so forth. And so we showed people the adverts like this. And then we asked them to rate them according to these different criteria. So how, how appealing, how effective, how humorous, how likely you'd be to seek further information or share on social media, or perhaps the one which was not that popular was to tag a friend. Not many people tended to choose that. And so in order to test the effectiveness of these adverts, we didn't just show them loads of adverts. We had three specific hypotheses based on the theory that I introduced at the beginning of the talk. Three hypotheses as to what might make the adverts most effective. And the first one comes up to comes along to splitting up the place name. So here we have this idea that um, more if more work is needed, if it's a little bit more creative, people are more likely to have ownership of, of, the, of the advert, are more likely to appreciate it because they think, oh, I've worked that one out myself. So you'll notice um, in the first one, Digbeth is the actual place, and it's just separated into Dig and Beth, but there's no words put between Dig and Beth. The same with the, the next one, having some fun with his custard factory. The custard factory is a part of Birmingham and the custard factory is kept together. But whereas the third one is a little bit different, Spark, Sparkbrook is a part of Birmingham, but they've pulled it apart and they've put the word with in the middle of Spark and Brook. And our hypothesis was that the, the, the adverts would be more effective if they actually kept the, the name together rather than splitting it up because you get the shock factor, you see the name and you think, okay, what, what, what's it to do with Digwood? What's it to do with the custom factory? And then you work out the other meaning yourself. So you have ownership of this rather creative use of language. Whereas got a spark with Brooke, the work has already been done for you. In a way you've got the, the with is already in there. So there's less working out to do in order to get to the meaning of it. So our hypothesis was that these kind of first two, and again, we had many, many examples like this, would be more positively evaluated than the ones where the, the name of the, of the place had already been split up and the work had already been done for you, as it were. And indeed, we found just here a couple of the, the responses. We did find that the original thing, so where the, the place name had not been split, people tended to appreciate them more than when the, when the place name had been manipulated, when it had been split and an extra little word had been added in between them. So that was our first hypothesis of three. The second one, you'll notice that when they came to um, create the creation of the expression, it, although the whole thing is creative, the, the double, the double entendre, the innuendo, is, um, the word play is all creative. The actual the expressions that were produced themselves also varied in terms of their level of creativity. So, Perhaps we start off with the ones on the right, the conventional metaphors, touch wood, dig Beth, and copying a Hansworth. Even though they're quite rude expressions, they are expressions that everybody knows. I mean, most people know those expressions in English. They're conventional ways of talking about things to do with kind of sexual encounters. Whereas the ones on the left, exploring their botanical gardens, having some fun with his custard factory, popping in his mailbox, they are not conventional expressions in English. They are kind of quite creative expressions. Nobody I know, I've never heard anyone say any of those expressions before I worked on this campaign with the company. So they are, the end result is more creative. And given what we said at the beginning about how novel metaphors are more likely to be embodied um, and therefore more effective and uh, more engaging, our hypothesis was that people would prefer these metaphors to these, these kind of posters to the conventional ones. And indeed, we found that to be the case. So here's just one example. People were more likely to seek information in the creative condition than the conventional condition. And then the third of our three hypotheses relates to the position in the sexual conquest narrative. We had to have some discussion before we could work out what to call this narrative because it's a little bit difficult to work out what to call it. But the idea here is you, you meet someone, you rather like them, you meet them and then you have the sexual encounter and then you catch the sexually transmitted infection. So these three adverts on the screen here correspond to the, the three stages of what we call the sexual conquest narrative. So dig Beth means you like Beth. Popping in his mailbox is the actual reference to the sexual activity. And is your ACOX green? That is the result of the activity. 
And now a hypothesis, given that um, action is more likely to trigger um, um, an embodied response to metaphor, and also the idea that you don't want to do, you want to do some work to work out the meaning, but not too much. So perhaps you don't want to be at the beginning of the scenario or at the end because there's not enough work or too much work involved in working out the meaning. Our hypothesis was that these would be the most effective. So the idea that the ones with the action would be most effective. And indeed, in a number of cases, a large number of cases, they were the most effective. So it was very nice. Um, umbrella. Um, uh, sexual Health um, and the Advertising Agency followed our recommendations and chose the adverts that we had recommended. And here's an example of um, some of the adverts in and around Birmingham uh, in case that, in case they're at the bus stop and somewhere in the shopping centre. So they're live adverts. They actually went ahead and used them. And there were a number of, they used them also online. And then in order to sort of test, you know, to see whether, whether this campaign was effective, because they're an advertising agency, they have loads of statistics in order to, to sort of see how, um, how effective they were. And you see that from the previous year to the year when they had the campaign compared to previous campaigns, there was a huge increase in the number of Facebook posts, advert impressions, advert clicks, massive increase. Um, website visits to their website went up by over a thousand. Appointments pages went up by over a thousand. Um, but I think that's the thing that's the most important is that the test, the number of testing kits ordered. So the, 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 the kits that people ordered to test whether they did have a sexually transmitted infection went up by 51%, which is huge. Um, and of those, 10% tested positive. So you might be able to say, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but you could say that as a result of this campaign, 778 additional sexually transmitted infections were diagnosed, including um, HIV uh, positive AIDS. So um, maybe we could we, we could say that the effective use of metaphor led to this number of people or helped contribute to this number of people detect and cure their sexually transmitted infection, which is a really interesting application of metaphor theory and cognitive linguistics, I think. And on now to the very last campaign that we did with, 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 this, with this company, one of the other things is that metaphor is particularly likely to engage with when it involves emotion and empathy. And none of the campaigns we worked on them with them was a campaign where um, people were going to swim the English Channel. So people have swum across the English Channel from England to France. And the idea of this campaign is that in order to help a charity, people would swim the length of the English Channel but not actually do it in the channel, they would do it in the swimming pool. So they, they would swim whatever it is, the 26 miles, whatever it is, but do a little bit each week in their channel. And so they were working on a campaign to um help to help encourage people to participate in this in this um in this challenge. And they had campaign, they had they were testing posters like this. So we had Meet Helen, Queen of the Tide, Meet Vicky, Channel Conqueror. Or they also had meet Marsha, breaker of waves, meet Paul, the human shark. And here we, we gave participants different um, posters and asked them to assess which ones they liked and why. Our hypothesis was that they would like these more because Queen of the Tide, a channel conqueror, you can see yourself in there. That could be you, whereas you might not want to be a human shark, for example, also with breaker of waves, one of the one of the participants or some of the participants in our study said, well, you could you could break waves by just jumping in the swimming pool and not doing any swimming. So it's not like you're actually achieving anything. And we did find in this study that people people liked these more strongly than they liked the these other ones. And so these were like more popular and more effective. Um, and so that's the studies that we did with the agency. This is us working with the agencies. That's Samantha, my student in the middle, and the people from the from the from Big Cat. And it's just nice again to see the application of metaphor theory into a real world situation and making a bit of difference to people's lives. So that's all the four blobs that I wanted to talk about. So we've looked at what is meta embodied metaphor and when and why a metaphor is embodied. We looked at it in two situations: one in relation to pregnancy loss and one in relation to advertising. But you'll notice, and, and as I said before. With this different terminology, we talked about it being embodied, activated, enacted. Also, 
internalized, reliteralized. So people seeing it as a as a literal thing or internalized, as in like with the with the um, embodied nature of pregnancy loss of the, of the of the loss. And so I think that's one way to sort of sum up all of these things is perhaps to talk about the extent to which um, metaphor is experienced. And we can see that by looking at, by paying close attention to sources of variation and the extent to which metaphor is experienced in a kind of literal or physical way, can provide quite interesting insights into the theory of embodied metaphor itself. But as importantly, it can make a difference to the world outside academia. So that's it. I mean, I'd like to finish just by thanking, this is not just me on my own who did these studies. These are some of the people with whom I, I've worked. I hope I've got everyone in there, probably many more. But also thanks to you for, for listening and for attending my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you for your uh, wonderful and uh, enlightening lecture. Actually, I think you lead us to a very wonderful academic journey this uh, this evening for us and this afternoon, like the time until. Uh, so uh, now, mm -hmm. uh, I think you have already given us a very good summary of your lecture. And so I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, it and to give a very brief summary. I, uh, so uh, this uh, evening, Professor uh, Janet Littlemore has given us uh, her recent studies and also previous wonderful studies. So she uh, began with a very beautiful uh, narration in talking about a dance metaphor, and then she ends this lecture with uh, with uh, a lot of ter uh, terminology related to uh, embodied metaphor. Uh, and in this talk, she tries to elaborate on the different meanings of embodied metaphor by uh, asking a question, what is embodied metaphor? And giving us a lot of different explanations there. And secondly, she introduces findings from her uh, recent and previous studies and to tell us when and why, by whom are metaphors embodied. And for when we talk about the variation of course, uh, metaphors, we have emotion, novelty, action, and foregrounding. And for uh, next part, by whom we talk about a variation across individuals, talking about individual differences, and really very interesting and uh, illuminating. And the third part includes two subparts, and we talk about the application of the theoretical and empirical work on embodied metaphor. So we have got two very, very uh, good uh, Investigations. The first one related to the improvement of care following a uh, pregnancy loss. And the second one is about the development of marketing campaigns relating to sexual health. Uh, so I think her talk and the, this evening provides us with a deeper understanding of the nature of embodied metaphor itself. In also, we have got a lot of interesting examples and a lot of uh, references and a lot of recent work. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful journey. And here, uh, I think it's a Q&A session. We still have some minutes and I will see uh, the questions here. So uh, can you see the questions here? Uh, yes, I can, yes. Should yeah, I answer some of them? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's up to you. You can choose if you like. Okay. To. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. So thank you for thank you for attending and thank you very much for your questions. Um, I think um, good question from Fang Yun. How, thank you. My question is how to come up with sound and valid metaphor in writing. I think this is tricky. I think that um, one of the things that I've found um, in in my work, some of the studies which I, I haven't mentioned here, is that. I've looked at metaphor appreciation and what makes people 
perceive a metaphor to be a good metaphor or an effective metaphor. And what I found is that um, the metaphor needs to draw to some extent and on some level on a conventional metaphorical mapping and then to give it a bit of a twist and make it a little bit different. Um, and that can be at different levels of conventionality. So it can, can be like a, a conceptual metaphor, but it can also be a, an idiom, which is a kind of more, more specific example. And that is better than a metaphor that's like completely like wild and, and left field and people don't know where it's coming from. Um, that study was something that I did with colleagues and we were looking at computer generated versus human generated metaphors. And when the metaphors had a, an element of conventionality or you could easily see an underpinning conceptual metaphor mapping, people were more likely to rate it as a positive good metaphor. And they were also more likely to say it being created by a human than by a computer, which I think is interesting. Um, I d and, then, and then Fangion again, is there a limit of embodied metaphors when we use them? Um, I think that I don't think because so, I think I think it's more whether met whether metaphor is embodied is the the extent to which people are experiencing it as embodied. So I suppose that it could get very exhausting to experience something on an on an embodied level the whole time, and maybe that's when people are getting kind of metaphor overkill, like too many creative metaphors, too many emotion, too much movement, and people do sometimes say that things can be too metaphorical. But I don't think there's, I'm not aware of any research that's actually empirically investigated that. So I think that that's a really interesting question, Fangion, and it'd be, it'd be good to know if that's um, something that you're working on. I don't know whether you have any comments on, on that, but I, li I like that question, or on or if, if I answered your other question appropriately. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for answering questions, and I thank you, uh, Thank Fang Yun for asking uh, the wonderful questions. And thank you. And let's see. Uh, uh, so, Thomas, uh, how about you? Do you have any questions? Okay, uh, Jenny, thank you very Hi. much for the talk. And uh, uh, it is very com comprehensive and contains a lot of data. Thank so, you. Uh, my question might be like this. Uh, is there any governing theories concerning the um, embodied metaphor? You you can hear a lot of parameters and uh, uh, very comprehensive. As you know, the uh, Lakeham and Johnson uh, metaphor we live by, we can summarize something like A is B. That is conceptual metaphor. A is B. Uh, yeah. Could you do this? Could you do a similar? A generalization on the uh, embodied metaphor, or is it still governed by the conceptual metaphor? I think I think what we're talking about. I think I think we we, we stick to with, with the A is B, but within that, the variation is along the lines of um, A is talked about as if it were B, A is talked about as if it were like B, and A is experienced as if it were be. So I think it's the it's the verb that we use to replace the is or to expand the is that is that is that I'm interested in. Whether we're talking about the level of it's talked about as if it were or as it is, or whether it is it experienced as. And so I I see for me, I, I see it developing the A is B idea um and unpacking the idea of what is means. So it's a kind of a, a development from the conceptual metaphor and the variations. I think so. Yes, I yeah, think it's. Thank you it's, very I think much. it's yeah. yeah, I think it's unpacking what they mean by is. Okay. Yeah. Thank and, you. And exploring the various the various ways in which A can be B, uh, whether it's an experience or just um, uh, a, a comparison or whether it's just a linguistic level. So it's the level of experience that I'm interested in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Janet. And I say we uh we only have three minutes left. And okay. if you like that, we we have uh we have some questions here again from Hi. another uh separate from Tencent meeting and yes. a lot of audience there. 
see her watching uh, you. Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you to everyone you there. there as well. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I can... uh, you can choose one. Yes, it, I, that's you. A, mm, very happy to pick that one up because I realised I didn't talk much about the W matrix and ant con findings. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, that was the... Um, so we developed corpora of the various responses that people produced in in when describing whether they thought the adverts were good and why they thought they were good or not good. And we and we used W matrix and Ancon to identify key words and also key semantic fields, which distinguish the responses of male and female participants and also older and younger participants. And it was very interesting. We found that, and also across the different adverts, and we found that with the male participants, there were lots of references to the to the humour, to the jokes, to the comedy, to the language. And in the female participants, there were way more significantly more references to the need to get treated for sexually transmitted infection um, and and the and the responsibility to do so. So it's very interesting that they were responding to the adverts on different levels. So the male participants were thinking, oh, these are funny, et cetera. And the females were saying, I need to do this in response to the advert. And so I think that was very, very interesting. And also in terms of the age as well, we had um, we had very, very strong kind of um, it, both in the statistics, but also in the in the words used, much stronger negative evaluation amongst the older participants and much more positive language um, in, amongst the younger participants in response to the adverts. So we used it to kind of nuance our findings. Um, and we also used it to compare responses to different types of advertisements. So you remember one of the formulations was um, splitting up the place name versus not splitting up the place name. And interestingly, we found that when the place name was not split up, so they actually had to do more work, participants said that this was actually easier to understand. And so it's almost like the opposite of what we expected. And I think maybe because they got the idea that they needed to see a pun and they needed to see kind of wordplay in those. So it, it allowed us to nuance the statistical findings. What I can do is I can send through the, the reference to that or a copy of that publication if people are interested. Um, we discussed that in much more detail. It's an article in Metaphor and Symbol. I can send that through. Um, and then the second one about implying theories of embodied metaphor in SLA. Absolutely. Yes, I think so. Yes. And there are lots of nice studies now. In particular, um, there is a new book in the Cambridge Elements series um, by um, Reyes Lopez Garcia on ways uh, in which embodied metaphor can be used in the teaching of grammar and vocabulary. And there's also work by Andrea Tyler, getting students to act things out, see things, watch videos of things moving rather than just having static language. So I think, yes, uh, huge potential for, for language teaching. Is that uh, is that okay for those questions? Okay, thank you, thank you very much, and let's thank audience for asking uh questions, and thank Janet for uh answer the questions. Uh, thank you very much, and I think time is up. You must be very tired because you prepared. Uh, you are so well prepared for this lecture. Just, oh no, uh, I've, it's given me lots of energy speaking to you all, so <laughs> I'm fine. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. So, thank uh, you for this. Uh... Yeah, from tomorrow, uh, more audience can watch your video from the uh, around the world from YouTube. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I tidied the bed before I <laughs> did it. <Okay. laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you okay. very much for the invitation. I really thank appreciate you. it, and it's been lovely. To, to 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 meet you all and to to, to hear the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. And yeah. you as well. Have, Have a nice evening, day. everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.